Right, okay, just need some volume and then we'll begin. So, just as a quick thing, I'm talking against, well, specifically, I'm talking against you in a way, because it's about, this is about how religiosity and authority in political regimes tie together, especially within the ritual realm of practice. So, what I'm dealing with is, a, is, a, is an interesting historical moment, especially for Sudan. Sudan being the largest, used to be the largest country in East Africa, is now, has now um, seen the secession of the South, making it this bizarre distinction which was always played upon by the, the Western press of this division of religiosity from the North, which is predominantly Arab Muslims, and the South, which is predominantly <coughs> Christians and animists. So essentially, what this has done, and the state kind of discourse surrounding what's happened, is that we can now properly become Muslim. What this means is, they, what this means in the sort of their practice, or under the statecraft now, post the secession of the South, is that they want to make fully Muslim subjects, which means that they shall be implementing further Islamist policies within their legal scheme, increasing the kind of Sharia domination. What counters this, especially in history, is the plural existence of Sufi brotherhoods. Now the Sufi brotherhoods, I mean, Sufism is the mystical kind of side of Islam. You may have been aware of it, you may be aware of Rumi, which is where, kind of in Persia, we saw sort of, what I've described as high Sufism. The things that are sort of more isolated from the actual practice of Sufism and more the reflection. This is the practice of Sufism as I see it in Northern Sudan. So, essentially, my point is, as I, as I shall go on to explain, these Sufi brotherhoods, while offering this pluralistic thing, this pluralistic view of Islam, have embodied the same domination that you see from the state-led um, state uh, Islamism that we see. And it's, be it's because of its history within Sudan. So in 1881, the Mahdi led a force of Sufi, his Sufi brothers, against the Turco-Egyptian Empire, or the Turkish-Egyptian Turkish Empire that was in place in Sudan, and completely annihilated. Thus, in stating a Sudanese state, the first Sudanese state with a centralized governing body of its own volition. And the interesting thing about the Mahdi was he came out of the Sufi Brothers. He was, by all, came from a humble background, educated in, within, um, within uh, Islamic um, jurisprudence, and then accelerated to covering the whole span of Sudan, gathering this motion. This revolutionary spirit through these Sufi brotherhoods to unite against. And the key kind of point which this happened was when he had what's called a, 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 a karma or a act of, um, act of sort of miracle, a miracle, where he envisioned the prophet come to speak to him in the night. What I'm looking for is how this radical kind of authority is seated within the practice practice of Sufi brothers still in the contemporary life, because they still remain, and this is a perfect example, they still remain in quite a traditional form. So as, as you see here, they're going crazy. <laughs> they're going crazy. Uh, this, this is the um, Hamadil and Neil. And there are lots of sects within Sudan following the Sufi, the Sufi path. This one, these are the Qadriya. Now, the Qadriya are one of the oldest forms. They were the first, in a sense, missionary forces within Africa of Islam. And they seated here in, seated here in, in Omdurman, which is the old capital, around this tomb of a former saint. Now, the reason I call them saints and the reason they call them self saints was that they can trace, they have what's called baraka within them, or ultimate blessing. And this ultimate blessing follows chains or silsila of their own blessing, which establishes this kind of genealogical transfer of authority and makes them just in themselves purely powerful, power of God, in a sense, charismatic authority in the Weberian classical model. So instantly I was here to look at where this power comes from in this charisma. Because as we see here, 
we've got all these different people walking in the middle. Now this is, this is the zikr, and the zikr is the remembrance which one must always do in part, in part of Muslim practice. However, the Muslim brothers, the Muslim brothers, sorry, there's a different contestation. The Sufi brothers take this enacted form where they follow a set of bodily, bodily practices, disciplining themselves and dislocating in the T.S. Eliot sense by repeating the words of God over and over again. They dislocate the meaning from it, destroying all sense of A, the signifier, but seeking seeking fusion with the signifier. Let's say it's God in this case, because it is God. However, this practice is always led by the Sheikh. Now the Sheikh is my point of study. The Sheikh, as there's many around here because this is the meeting place of lots of sects, that they um, they instruct the Murid or followers in how to conduct themselves to reach union, spiritual reunion, union with God. The way they do this is through education, not just in the body, but also through reading, which is why they spread. And in my in my uh, in my analysis of the Mahdian um, state, this is where the rational, legal, or the rudeization of all char charis charisma took place, because this was not just the charismatic individual developing his own state out of nothing and making it purely about himself is then leaving a code of conduct left behind. One that the state could be said is trying to re recreate, however with no, with no charismatic authority left. What we do see here within the Sufi Brotherhoods is this marriage of charismatic, of charismatic authority here, but because I should go on to give you two more examples of two different other sects. The interesting thing about this sect is the Murid. Now these Murid aren't just the people that literally follow and devote their whole lives to the chefs or to the saints. You also have lots of public from working class families right around the edge. So you have, here's the tomb, there's plenty of the women here, women and children here, men follow around the side, and why? And um, and you have this kind of opening up to the public. Lots of people just interested in going to see it. It's almost the biggest tourist site in Sudan, which has no tourist industry whatsoever. And uh, um, and it's this kind of what draws the people to them isn't this. Th there is no kind of because of education systems actually being held by what we could call the middle classes or the literate um, in Sudan, which is um, because of certain education schemes, especially around the Sufi Brotherhoods, has been complicated in <coughs> different places. We have this attraction <coughs> to the charisma <coughs> over the rational legal authority. And so this is one thing I'm looking at. So one, you can almost see the revolution, revolutionary spirit in this as it's the easiest thing to grab to, because as you see as this man approaches the character, Camera, he is the most powerful individual ever see carrying the sword and carrying with him all the, all the kind of authority which you must follow. Now I'll switch to another case. Now this, I went to, these are some of the most popular sects in Sudan operating at the moment. This guy, Sheikh Garibullah, or this is his sect, operates also in the same city but with a much different style and you'll see there is a radically different kind of thing. You see them far more ordered. There is the circle in the zikr. This is one line. The sheikh, in this case, isn't present whatsoever. But you do still see the 300 people in this one line doing exactly the same thing at the same time. The only people that are leading it are the khalifa. And the khalifa could be, say, as replicated by the example of the prophet's history within the media, within the Medina, sorry, were, were the second in command that take over. In this case, we see nothing, they don't have any, they don't dress any different, they don't stand out, they're pure, as you see. Job is to instruct, as the arm goes up and down, the arm goes up and down, everyone follows the same code. Interestingly here, as we were talking about apprenticeship, we have an apprentice here. 
see different colored thing, different colored uh, jellabia or rope without a belt on at all and he's holding the hand of his brother to commence in the exact same thing. So I mean one thing I really was looking at here is where is this conformity coming in this case without the presence of the charismatic authority? How is it still there? And you can see it as I said in less than the dislocation of meaning because you can't hear them say anything. They don't we just go Ooh. It's more about the breathing, and as you'll see in a second, they have a far more complicated set of bodily dispositions that they do. The jumping is the most, of course, exhaustive, other than talking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, I was, so I was looking at what authority lies here, because, I mean, the shape isn't there. There is no presence. He has literally left a structure of power. And so I was looking at kind of the the differences in power and reflecting what they kind of show about the Sufi chefs. Because we have a rational legal authority. Rational legal authority in the in the work of Weber obviously has nothing to do with religion. It's what's meant to happen, it's what's meant to produce the iron cage, the absolute modernity which with the separation of religion and politics. However, because there has not been the separation of religion and politics since the British Empire you don't have that authority present. You don't have that authority regardless of religion. And so we see this religiosity embedded within them. Now this has taken different forms across the, across the history of Sudan. This one has followed the same model for a long time. However, the Sheikh himself is doing an amazing thing. Well, amazing thing. He's becoming more of this politician, he wants to organize the Sufi, he wants to organize the brotherhoods together to resist state sanctioning of Sufi mosques. So here we have this clash. We have this clash of the underbelly, let's say, sub-political, although with its intermediary, with its uh, interactional power, then may I remind you that the Murid or the follower must do everything the Sheikh commands. It's direct. If you follow him, you follow every instruction. And with the last example, this instruction goes deep. Very, very deep. Now, as I said, as I described before, most sheikhs in the charismatic sense have to perform karam or acts of miracles within which they kind of there's a resource of authority there. What we have here in this case is really interesting. He's called Sheikh Gary Butler. No, no, it's not Sheikh Gary Butler, it's Sheikh Al Amin. But um, he is a millionaire, one of the only millionaires working outside of business or politics in Sudan. How does he earn his money? He has this huge pool of charismatic ability to earn money like this. He's the ultimate capitalist, having all spirit without any presence, just by flying in literally mythical ways. He, the, most of his karamats, karam his miracles are explained as, most of his um, miracles have been explained as transporting in time instantly. And with this, he's gathered, he's, he's gathered all the kind of, oh shit. <laughs> he's gathered all the kind of bourgeois, these young professional men, in an incident around him, and he promises, he promises to each and every one, fame, money, and women, if you follow me, have full subservience to me, and do everything that I say. Now what, as I, said, as I was talking about the disposition of bod bodies within practice of Zika, if you look as he trails his nephew who's getting married, and that's why it's quite a special occasion, with his sword, again, this very charismatic, rigid rod of pure power, you see that his Maureen aren't doing any of the disciplined bodily techniques. <coughs> it's almost as they all describe, being in his presence, being within his love, that they receive all of his blessing to then take it onto the world. And so from here I argue that from here I argue that, yes, you see this marriage of charisma. However, 
there is no career, there is no rational legal way, legality of making money within such within such a strong hold that the state has. And so the only way to reach this is by following that sword. Just another just another point, you need to have guns. It always to be guns, but they'd fire up in the air as they did the zicker, but um, they banned that because the noise. <laughs> <laughs> So to conclude, we must use Weber's, or we must return to Weber's authority uh, so for ideal types of authority if we are to look at religious, the relationship of religious practice and state, and state power as reflections of each other. <coughs>